Well, good morning, venue. It's good to see you today. I love this room. I love coming down here. And uh, I have the benefit every week of being in all the rooms except Edmund. I can watch Edmund uh, a little later. But uh, it's been a special day around here, I tell you. It's just been uh, pretty amazing. I, I walked into the venue, or the chapel this morning, and uh, over to my right was Bruce Bacchus. And if you know Bruce, he lost his brother this week and a, a terrible accident that happened a week ago. And so I've been crying all morning, basically, you know, just uh, because they, they're just, we're just surrounded by, all of us are, we're just surrounded by some pain and some hurt. And uh, I think one of the best places to run to in these moments is to each other in the church family and the body of Christ. And so I'm, I'm glad Bruce was here today, and uh, I'm glad that you're here today. And uh, there's, there's a lot of people this week I know around our city and in other states who are, are in the same boat we're in in terms of some, just some tough moments that we've had to, to face lately. But God is still God. And I think this leads for me to be able to say, never has it been more important to be really clear about your belief in Jesus Christ and to get really clear about what it means, get really clear about how do you cultivate that? How do we grow up spiritually? That's very important. So we need to come to understand that. So we're a church that we, you know, we gather for worship. And, uh, and I'll be honest with you, I've been in, uh, having been in all the rooms this morning, um, and when I listen to the Edmund every Sunday, I, I step back, I'll be honest with you, and I wonder how, how is it possible that every room is not jammed full of people? Now, right now, COVID still has us scared a little bit, but there's something special that happens. And I hope that can be said in every church in town. But I hope we're taking advantage of what God is giving us that's highly unusual. I've been in church all my life. I promise you, this moment is highly unusual. And it's a sweet moment. We gather because we need each other. We don't gather when we can fit it in. We don't gather when we have time. We gather because we need each other. I've got to be around people that I consider fairly sane. Now, the person next to you may disagree with me on that one. But I've got to be around other people that I know we're all together in, in knowing that Jesus is our ultimate hope. I need that. Whether I work here or not, I need that. We gather together for worship. We grow up then spiritually in our faith. Now, a lot of you may not know what, what it even means to grow spiritually. When you hear that term spiritual growth, uh, what, what that may mean to you means something entirely different to someone else. What does it imply? And if we're to grow spiritually, how do we do it? How do we know it's working? So in other words, what is spiritual growth? Uh, John Ortberg, Pastor John Ortberg uh, says this, growth is handcrafted, not mass produced. God's desire is to create the best version of you. So maybe at least this will help you understand why we think it's very important that we somehow get within a group or a class occasionally to learn what it means to be a child of God, to know what those benefits are, to know exactly how that works, to, to get acquainted with this incredible gift we've been given in Jesus Christ. And another thing I, we believe here, that's why we have kind of so many classes and maybe different offerings uh, to grow your faith, is growth is not handcrafted. It is, it is, not, it is handcrafted, it's not mass produced. One size doesn't fit everybody. I've always felt that. And that's why we have, uh, some would say maybe too many, but we have a lot of different ways for you to find how can you know Jesus like you've never known him before? How can you live in light of his love for you? I've often uh, quoted Henry Cloud. I remember the first time I heard this, and I mean, I couldn't tell you what I said in the, in the chapel service this morning, <laughs> but I've never forgotten this because it's so true. I grew up in church, and I was good. I had no church problems. I grew up in wonderful churches, two of them, which was awesome. But Henry Cloud kind of summed up what we sometimes feel spiritual growth really is when he says, God is good, you're bad, try harder. <laughs> how, many, how many of you have gotten that message in church somewhere in your life? God is good, you're bad, so try harder. So I can try, here's, here's what I want you to see this morning. We can try to do something or we can train to do something. Spiritual transformation is not a matter of trying harder, but training wisely. And this is what the Apostle Paul means when he encourages Timothy. He says, Timothy, I want you to train yourself in godliness. 
There's this big difference between trying to do something and training to do something. So I can try to do something. Now there's things we can all do. We don't have to try that. It comes after we've cultivated. It's kind of who we are. And there's something we all can do in our lives, several things maybe, that we do pretty well. There are other things we don't do, we haven't trained to do, and we shouldn't even dream of doing it unless we're willing to go through the training. For example, if I become convinced that I've got to run the Memorial Marathon with Kim, uh, it might, I, I don't go there because I'm certain it could cause my untimely death. So if I become, but if I become convinced that I've got to run this marathon for health reasons, to be a supportive husband, I can't just say, well, I'll go try to run that with you. Even Kim, as an experienced runner, an avid runner, she's always running and training. So I would have to go train myself and run more to get ready to do a marathon, all right? So, I mean, I, right now I sense no nudging of God to do that at all. And uh, God knows all that running would make me miserable. It'd be painful. It would distract me from God's love and grace. So why would I want to do that? <laughs> so I don't go down that path and it, it would blind me from the wonderful love of Jesus because I'd be so angry that how I feel, you know. So I just say to Kim, you, I'm, I'm here for you. I'll be here in the car with uh, my Diet Coke and chips. And when you're done, you come on and I'll take you home and you can relax. So that's kind of how it rolls at our house. <laughs> There's a big difference when I try to do something and when I train to do something. Dallas Willard, tremendous, tremendous theologian. He's now with the Lord. If you, if you don't have his books, get them. He says that following Jesus simply means, here it is, learning from him how to arrange my life around the activities that enable me to live in the full fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to say that again. Following Jesus simply means learning from him and how to arrange my life around things that enable me to live in the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Dallas Willard says, I didn't say anything about having a quiet time. All right, now stop for a second. I'm not getting ready to trash the, the habit or the training of having a time set aside every day to spend with the Lord. I think it's wise to do that. I do want you to understand if God is available beyond 6 or 7 a.m., all right? Because there are people that believe, you know, and I, we have to have our different rhythms, all right? We're all very different here. Now, so... Willard says that in the context because he's got a young pastor sitting in front of him when he's telling this story. And the pastor just feels defeated. He says, I just, I'm not doing anything. I'm not having this time with God first thing in the morning. I'm not, he just says, I'm really not doing very well. I don't feel like I'm a very good Christian. And so this is when Dallas says to him, I didn't say anything about you having a quiet time. He says, people in church, including pastors, have been crushed with guilt over their failure at having a regular quiet time or daily devotions. Is that a bad thing? No, not at all. It needs to happen. It should happen. I'm not saying don't do it. But we carry guilt over it, and carrying guilt over not doing it isn't the answer to get us to start doing it. And, and Willard continues, and when they do begin to start trying to find what it looks like to have a healthy soul, it's hard to recognize he says, let me tell you something I would suggest beyond the 15 minute, and, and I know a lot of people that spend an hour with God first thing in the morning. Kim's one of those. She's diligent about that every morning. So let me tell you though, there's a lot of times maybe, and I remember we did a thing here once that you have your chair time and spend 15 minutes in your favorite chair sometime through the day and spend that 15 minutes praying and just talking to God and listening. 15 minutes. Wow, that's a lot to give a God that's given us everything, isn't it? You know. Willard said, you know, I'm not worried about the first 15 minutes of your day. What I get most concerned about is the next 23 hours and 45 minutes. You must arrange, here's what he says, you must arrange your day so that you're experiencing total contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. And however that happens, let's make it happen in our lives. We've used three words around here through the years, uh, head, heart, and hands. Our, our minds, are, that's where we're going to know and learn. The intellect, it's knowing. The heart is where we become something as a result of what we're learning. 
And we become, uh, you know, our heart, the heart of who we are, not just the heart that pumps blood, but the very heart, inner workings of who we are, we become something because of what we're learning. Because now what I know, it changes something about me. That's how it works when you follow Christ. And then the result of that is ultimately hands, head, heart, hands. It becomes, I'm, I can't help but want to do something that serves other people and demonstrates what Jesus looks like to me. And we've seen those words quite a bit around here. Head, heart, and hands. Now what I want to propose for you today is, is a very simple, balanced approach to your experience with Jesus. Because here's what happens. You know, it's like a dietician will tell you, you need to have a good balanced meal. You need to eat good balanced meals. Fruits and vegetables and lean meats and all those things. We're supposed to eat salads and carrots and all that good stuff that's good for us, all right? Getting hungry already, aren't you? Except a lot of us want to, you know, to eat our zucchini fried, I mean fried zucchini. So we're still getting a vegetable, but it just tastes a little better. So, so what, we talk about having a well-balanced diet for good health. What I want to hope to present to you is not a formula you need to follow, although we like those. But I want to give you the balanced, what, what I believe is a very balanced approach for a spiritual experience that has you growing ever deeper in your faith, in your knowledge, but in your loving and following Jesus. In Colossians chapter two, I wanna read this, verse six and seven, and I want you to watch the words. We're gonna start with the head. Head, hands, heart. So the head is the intellect, it's the knowledge. So look for the words I've listed there. They're, they're gonna show up in this passage in Colossians chapter two, starting at verse six. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Continue and follow. Let your roots grow down into him. Let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. And what will happen as a result? You will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ who is the head of every ruler and every authority. Do you hear those words? What are we doing when we're growing up in our spiritual life? When we're finding it, when we're cultivating, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What's that look like? Well, we're going to follow, for one. We're making a commitment. We're going to follow. We're going to, dig, we're going to pray and dig some deep roots in our, in our faith, in our, in our heart, soul, and mind. We're going to find out what does this mean. We're going to build a faith that helps us trust better. The other day, I'm having more of these moments where there might be an issue, a difficulty, uh, and I shouldn't be admitting this, that it took me this long, but uh, along the way, it's been progressively happening as I've trusted God more and more. But there's, there's just moments that would come along. You can't control it. You can't stop it. You can't even quite understand it. You know you need to fix it. And I've always been a fixer, and I'll go try to fix it, which typically breaks it even more when I try to fix it. And it wouldn't long ago, these, some of these issues we've been facing in our culture, in the world, in our church, in our city, just was eaten at me. And I had to take that moment, I truly, I had to say, I can't fix this. Lord, show me the role you want me to have if you want me to have one. I'm all ears, all eyes open, but I'm gonna leave it in your hands until you show me. That's, that's just faith. Everything in me wants to, wants to fiddle with it, wants to try to convince someone something. So it's, it, I'm telling you, it's feeling a lot better to come to a place in your life where you realize, I sweated over a lot of things in my 30s and 40s that were not worth sweating over. I'd love to help you with that. Those of you who are in that season now, it's a tough season, believe me. You know that. So when we talk about our minds, the intellect, the head, the head knowledge, it's ta it talks to us about following, digging roots, strengthening in our faith, learning what truth is of the scripture, being thankful for what we've now discovered. Now there's a word of caution we have, I, I wanna give you, and it's very important. There's a word of, here's what happens to believers. I've been there, some of you are there, some of you have been there. Over time, what you find yourself doing is you're worshiping the word. You're worshiping 
This becomes the object of your worship. This, this becomes, it's all about know this, read this, know this, read this. Anything wrong with that? Not at all. I highly recommend it. And frankly, I will admit to you that I have to deal with probably one of my struggles. I tend to worship worship. I can worship in worship. Somebody write this down. This is the tongue twister of the year. Okay, I can worship in a worship service, but what I tend to do sometimes is worship, worship. I love worship. I love great music. I like to play it. I, I, it was always my dream, you know, to be in music and play it and be a part of it. So I've, I can find the sum, if I'm not careful, the sum total of my daily devotions are going to be a lot of worship music I'm listening to, and it helps me, believe me. I mean, my Toyota becomes a sanctuary. I mean, there's some, uh, there's some awesome music in that thing. We got some, I got some great speakers in there. And so what I can do is I, I might have to pull over because I'm in a worship mode. I'm getting some tears in my eyes. And it's like, now it's not, it's not time to worship going down the Kilpatrick at 70 miles an hour. You, you know, so in other words, I'm admitting if I, because of my love for music and worship, I can worship worship. Now here's a warning that Jesus gave us when we start worshiping something other than him. Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. Jesus is just saying, now, did Jesus in any way diminish the scriptures? No. He's helping us understand what the role and purpose is of the scriptures, of the Bible. You search these scriptures because you think they're gonna give you eternal life. This doesn't give eternal life. You, you know that. But the scriptures, this, this points us to Jesus. This points us to the only one who can give us life. Paul issued a warning. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. We know that. We're, if we're not careful, we can get very much overconfident in what we know. And nothing wrong with that until you're out of balance, until it's all about knowledge and then worship might get scooted off to the side or, or your heart, what's changing? Sometimes it stays up here. We've got to move whatever we learn, whatever we know, it's got to move into a change of heart and focus and outlook. And unfortunately, I know a lot of people who can worship the word so much, they never get to that hands part about inviting the neighbor over for coffee or spending some time in a homeless shelter. And you know what? I've also known people who worship the serving, the hand part. I know a lot of people, they don't, they don't that big on Bible study, not that big on worship, but boy, they want all of us to join them in serving somewhere. It's wonderful that they serve, but it's not a balanced diet. Some people are called there, yeah. Some people are gifted to do certain things. We all are. This is a balanced approach. This is what I'm calling a balanced meal spiritually. So a practical warning is we must be very caref careful that we're worshiping and focused on the right thing for the right reason. Uh, there's a preacher's kid that I, uh, he grew up very similar to me. His dad was a very, very uh, pr a prominent pastor. And he was writing about the fact that um, he had a formula that, and I grew up with that too. We, we all came out of that. Now, did it hurt us? No, it didn't. Where there was this formula when I was growing up, and I've, I've done this formula as a pastor of this church uh, back through the, through the years. Let me, and I'd say, I'm gonna, and I've said this, I've, I've said this from the stage here at, down at Belle Isle and here at Crossings. I'm gonna ask you to do these four things, and I want four hours, one hour of this, one hour, you know, I don't know if you remember, some of you remember that. Most of us have forgotten it, <laughs> you know, that's how effective it was. So here's what a lot of churches will tell you. You're go, if, if you really wanna grow spiritually, you're gonna attend Sunday morning worship Every, every week, you're gonna then go to a Sunday school class, you're gonna break out and be a part of a small group, you're going to uh, take the fourth step and that is you're going to get involved in some discipleship and equipping class. This is all in one week, by the way. 
and then you're going to get involved in serving, find a place of ministry where you can serve, but yet to do that, there's one more hour involved, and that's knowing what your spiritual gift is. And please do not wait to serve, waiting to find out what your gift is. We're all called to serve, the least of these, so go serve. Now, you might have a spiritual gift that'll take you a specific direction, that's fine. I just gave you a menu of six things. And this preacher's kid named Andy Stanley who I just love the guy. He said it really produced well-informed graduates who were exhausted. What demonstrates this growing, vital relationship with God? There, there are many things in the Bible that give us things to think about, how to live, how to handle our lives, but it's not just a formula. It's not six steps we all need to do or even four steps we need to do. Some of us might need all six of those. We might need a list of 10 things. Some of you just need a few. What does God want to do to help you become the person he's created you to be? It takes time with him, yes, for sure. But what is the overarching concept of growing in Christ? Jesus said this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, all right? He says it's the first one, it's the greatest one. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All the law, everything that's been written in the law, it all hangs on these two commandments. So we have the intellect, we want to learn, we do want to read our Bibles, we want to learn, we go to Bible studies, and we come to understand what that word means. And then the heart begins to change. So since you choose to be the holy people he loves, then we clothe ourselves with tenderhearted mercy. Then we learn, hearts begin to change, and then we start serving. It causes us to take action. And then suddenly God's gonna use us. We call it using it like our hands. He's gonna say, you, I've gifted you to do something really powerful and I want you to do it. I want you to be able to carry that out. The head is knowledge, it's the intellect, it's important. The heart is we're becoming a certain kind of person. We're being something. We love the Lord our God with all our hearts, so mind and strength. And then we're, Serving. We're, we grow, have a growing concern for people that we love, people that we know who don't know anything about Jesus. They have no idea they can be forgiven. They have no idea there's hope in Christ. Jesus spent much of his time on earth teaching and dealing with the re religious elite people who knew more than anyone, yet the knowledge did not make them more loving, kind, or forgiving, patient people. I've encountered a lot of people. I really have. And I, I'm not, I, I don't mean to be critical of it, but I, some of the people I've known throughout my years in ministry who are the most knowledgeable about the Bible aren't very fun to be around sometimes. Because they say they're, they're, they're kind of on that worship the word part. They're, they're not seeing that, we're not seeing it translate into a change of how we treat people and how we love people. And then what we do as a result of knowing how much we have been loved. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, here's what we do. We clothe ourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And the list gets longer. Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. If I've ever, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a time like right now, what's going on in our country, in our world, where this has probably never been as hard to do as it is. And I don't want to stir up anything here, but when I hear about a family that is divided because of one, their disagreement about masks, really? Really? I respect those that want to wear them if 
Respect those who don't. There's a lot of stuff both ways. I, I know families that have divided over politics. Are you serious? Jesus didn't say, I, I want you to make allowance for each other's fault and forgive everybody, only if they agree with you. And the world has drawn us into their narrative. They've drawn us into this. You're either believing what I believe, you think what I think, or you be done and get away from me. I have nothing to do with you. That is not allowed, folks, if you're a Christ follower. Amen. That is simply not possible to follow Christ to love him, to love others like he loved us, and get angry with them over a mask or a vaccine. I know this is all important, life and death, all those kinds of things. I know all that. I get it. All Jesus, I, I think Jesus is saying, you can have strong feelings about all kinds of things, but the minute those things start dividing a relationship, busting a friendship, disturbing a family, it has gone way too far. And that cannot be in the person claiming to follow Christ or the family claiming to be living life in Christ. Make allowance for each other's faults. There's some people that don't get it. Maybe they don't. Well, let it be. You're not the one that God's put on the planet to change their mind. Forgive anyone who offends you. You can be offended every day. Do you remember that people can offend you? People are prickly. You can get really close and it hurts. Forgive anyone who offends you. I don't want to forgive people who've offended me. I want to give them a piece of my mind. But I've been giving people a piece of my mind for 40 years. There's not much left. So <laughs> remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And that's why I think it goes from knowing it to changing how we feel into how we're going to treat others. Because I've been so forgiven. I mean, God has been so kind to me to forgive me of things that if you knew about, you wouldn't come back to this church. I'm a sinner saved by grace as much as anybody in the room. All right, now if we don't remember that I, I am overwhelmed that God is willing to overlook and forgive me and forget and, and, and separate as far as the east is from the west. That's what the Bible says. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, above all this, Clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Clothe yourselves with love. That's what binds us together. And I can say to people, you may be, a, you're a jerk, frankly, but I love you and I forgive you. I'm just not gonna be around you much, you know? Or I can say, we disagree. We have such a huge disagreement on this subject, but I think you're the greatest person. Could we just not bring it up anymore? Are we gonna really let that blow a friendship? Really? Let the peace of Christ that comes, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule. And so what am I asking you to consider today? I just simply want to know, are you enjoying a growing experience with Christ that is taking in all the variety that he wants us to understand, what we will know, letting it penetrate the inner person that we are, and so it will begin to change us. You better be able to look back five years and say, I'm a different person today. I'm doing things differently today than I was doing two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. Is your knowledge awakening in you a heart of gratitude and thanks for God's love for us? Is this leading you to be more concerned about the brokenness around you? Galatians 5 says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the result of allowing God to change your thinking, change your heart, the heart of the matter, and then to change who you love and why you love them. Let me ask you a question. Just some questions I'll leave you with. Do I have a desire to know God and discover what he has in plans for me? That you gotta, if you're not developing your faith, if you're not growing spiritually, you've gotta answer this question. Do you even desire to know God and discover what he has for you? I hope you are, because it's amazing what you're gonna find out. Do I find it easier to forgive? <laughs> I've said enough on that already. Some of you are now trying to forgive me right now. I know you are. So, do, do I have an increasing and growing faith? 
Am I getting more angry about the world or am I getting deeper in my faith, trusting God? This world has never promised to deliver what we expect it to deliver. We should know that by now. Jesus is the only hope we have of getting through this. Do I have a growing desire to be careful in how I let the world influence me? I've already said enough. Don't let anything, don't let anything become more important than Jesus' presence in your life and his light shining through you. Do I have a growing love for other people? Can we love people that don't see things our way? Can we love people who see things very differently? Do I really have a growing love for other, I mean everybody? Do I have a growing desire for others to know the love and forgiveness that's available in Christ? Am I aware, do I have a greater awareness? You know what, what getting closer to the Lord will do? It makes you more aware of our tendency to give in to temptations that are destroying us. We're more aware of it. Do I have a growing desire for God to speak into every aspect of my life? To say, God, I'm an open book. Whatever I'm missing, I want it. We're going to take some time to pray before we leave this room. There's a, a great uh, song that we're going to close with. And we're going to give you a time to think this through. Just let it settle for a moment. The prayer teams will be at the front at the end of the, uh, this, the uh, song. And we'll dismiss after that. The song says very clearly, when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. Let's hear these words. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to be in church today. We take it for granted because we have brothers and sisters around the world today who have gathered and they're risking their lives. Father, we thank you so much for the way you have shown us your love. You've demonstrated your love when we were yet sinners, the Bible says. You loved us when we didn't deserve it. Father, help us to become people who will love like that. Help us to know clearly what we believe. Help us, Father, to know how it can change our lives. And may it result in how we treat others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.